Hello and welcome to The Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles Anyagulu. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, he's arguably Nigeria's best and most loved comedian, certainly one of Africa's top actors, satirists and rib tickling favorites. The indomitable, hysterically funny Nkem Owo is my guest today, and he'll be fielding a barrage of deeply personal questions about his life, his career, and how he's come to be a true comedy legend who can make you cry from laughing and an absolutely terrific actor with great staying power who continues to generate a huge buzz wherever he goes and who continues to break box office records. Nkem Owo, Nigeria's top comedy favorite, coming up. So another weekend, another wonder, as we welcome one of the most popular faces of Nollywood and Nigerian comedy in the last two decades. He's the unsurpassable Nkem Owo, and over the last 20 odd years he's been on stage, on television and in cinemas performing rib-tickling skits to hilarious applause from millions of adoring fans. From his very first appearances on VHS video right through to his glorious and masterful big screen classic Osofia in London as well as the groundbreaking Lionheart which travelled all the way to the Academy Awards and Kem Owo's career has been nothing short of brilliant. So funny and beloved is he across Nigeria and Africa, and such an inspiration to so many. Well, in a moment, we'll meet Nkem Owo and find a fresh appreciation of one of Nigeria's most prolific actors and unassuming comedy greats. But first, let's remind ourselves of some of his unforgettable performances. The African man is here. In my back. Who sent you? Look at you. I haven't even arrived. You want to snatch my bag from me? They told me about this kind of thing. Here. Oh. Um. Welcome, Mr. Sophia. We've been expecting you. I am not Sophia. I have told you people this thing. You people have been mutilating my name, using your axe to, to, to wire my name from airport. To this very place, I don't want anybody to modulate my name again. I am a Sophia Zibongo Kodi. And who are you, by the way? I'm, I'm Samantha, your brother's fiance. My brother's fiance. My brother didn't tell me that he had a fiance. Anyway, you are a beautiful woman. I think I will inherit you with the other property. Uh, what do you mean by that? I hope you know that I'm coming to take over. In my place, when I want to take over, I take over all of them diagonally. Everything that belongs to my brother, including you. Anyway, that is not the, the issue now. I am so hungry now. I have been going from one shop to another, and they have been giving me milk and chingoma as wheat. I need good food, so now you have to go and prepare very good food. I brought some work. At the airport, they didn't allow me to bring everything. Um, what are you doing? I want you to go and prepare a very nice soup. You may pro probably not have a broco. That is the best, uh, best thing. I don't know what you're talking about, um, but I can't cook. Well, I don't cook. I don't have to cook. You don't cook? No. You don't have to cook. And you are a woman. So what has my brother been doing with you? Are you his toy? No one that think my brother died of starvation. No. Come, where are you going? When you are ready, Jeeves will show you to your room, okay? Look, let me tell you, do not took, took nonsense from you. I will not take it to. I can divorce you now before bride price. Look at her. You are hopping into, into the desert without even attending to me. You are hopping in. You see, you see me when the time comes. No wonder. You yeah, can't cook. That's why you're eating like a bed. From this one to this one. Only fruit and water and juice. <laughs> I should have gone with my dog if I had known they have this thing. Uh, uh, where is the latrine now? Where 
Let us go. Excuse me. Hello. What I'm looking for is latrine. Where I the hole where I can sit down and pass whatever I have. Sir, here is the hole. Is where? Here, sir. Here? Sir. Here, sir. This is where you people do it. This one is breakable. If I sit on it, it will break. No, sir. I want you to show me a hole on the floor where I can now comfortably pass it. In this country, this is where you do your business. Oh, I am not a businessman. I look, I say, I want to pass out this thing. You are saying, where I do, I do, I stay, I do business. You sit down here, sir, and then you flush. The cannon I have is this different from what we have. Because I have been holding this thing back from the airport. By the time I pass this cannon here... Absolute cracker. And the hugely talented Nkem Owo joins me now from our studios in Lagos. Uh, Kem, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Absolutely brilliant to see you. And I'm just watching thank that skit. I me. mean, I, I know you, <laughs> you yourself. That's what's extraordinary. You actually laugh when you watch yourself because it is funny not just to you <laughs> but to everyone else i mean people in the studio here are absolutely bawling over sort of laughing their heads off and you seem to have that natural talent for making people laugh i mean oftentimes you don't even have to say anything just a look from you and people burst out laughing why do you think people find you and your characters so amusing? Well, uh, I think it is better for people to laugh when they see me than people to cry. So I take it as a, a positive contribution from me that people look at me and laugh. Well, uh, it's not by my powers the way they say it. Uh, I think it's uh, the way God wills it. And I'm happy about it. I have to say we are certainly happy that, that you have that capacity to make people laugh. I'm just looking at, for example, that absolute box office hit, Osophia in London. I mean, it was very popular in Nigeria, across Africa, in, in, even in the UK. How do you prepare for those characters? I mean, do, do you work really hard at creating them or do, or do they come naturally to you? Because, I mean, it all seems so easy and smooth when we see the finished product at the cinema. Well, the thing is that I don't think I prepare for it. Just like you said, I think it's a natural gift. At times, I watch it like you, every other person does after the production but when i'm in the production i think i don't really act the character i behave the character that's why i come to find out after analyzing myself on screen i think i behave the character more than acting the character and it's a gift from god well uh, as i said i i think your 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 um people would be inclined to agree that um you, you are, it is fair to say, a staple in Nigerian comedy. Um, there's nobody who doesn't know you. I mean, do, do, do you find the fact that you're known everywhere? I mean, I came across you on a plane once, and I just remember the way people were flocking around you. You looked a little bit flustered, I have to say. I mean, do, do you find that to be thrilling, or, or is that too much attention on you? Well, <clears throat> when I started, I think uh, like uh, a rookie that I was then, I was uh, feeling uh, somehow, I blush at times when the, the people rush me like that and they try to point comments on me. But with time, or over time, I came to realize that it's a part of the business. I mean, if you are in this business, in entertainment and the show business, at a stage, you will begin to manage your stardom, particularly when you become a star. So I think God has helped me to manage my stardom. I think I'm doing a good job of it from what I hear from people around me. Yes, well, I mean, you, you've obviously become fantastically successful in Nollywood and in comedy. I mean, briefly, how did you launch yourself into that career path? 
All right. Uh, I will say that I started when I was working with television. I was a stringer at uh, the old Anambra television uh, station in Enugu from NTA, NTA Nigerian Television Authority. I was an assistant producer or production assistant, as we were called then. So uh, I was, when I started, I think I was behind the scene more than in front of the camera. I was uh, writing profusely. I wrote uh, Bassey and Company, that's the Madam the Madam is a Matter of Cash. That was a, a sole creation of uh, uh, Ken Sarawa, God bless his soul. He was our master then, and he taught me a lot of things about writing. And I started writing Bassi and Company. From there, I started writing New Masquerade. And from there, I uh, started writing. That was one thing that was created for Radio Nigeria then. I, it was called Matters Arising. And I wrote, uh, I think, uh, 26 episodes. That was uh, about two quarters. So I actually started by writing. From writing, people were urging me to come in front of the camera because behind the camera, I was making people laugh without even knowing it. So uh, pressure from people made me realize I have something that uh, makes people happy uh, in the nature of comedy. So what I did then was not launching myself in front of the camera, but right as I was a writer, I write some scripts and give myself some subtle rules to see what it would look like if I come in front of the camera. And I tried it first, I tried it a second, and I saw that uh, uh, people were buying it. So I fully came in front of the camera. That was uh, an extension of uh, this uh, Nigerian Nollywood thing. Even before we baptized it as Nollywood, we were just doing it as things to make people happy. Uh, you, you know, after the Civil War, even though it had been a long time, after the Civil War, people didn't find a place to ease off, and tension was mounting. So we're looking for corners uh, where we can... Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad you. Um, I'm, I'm glad you got into it at that stage, um, in Kem. And uh, please stay with us. We're going to come straight back to you. We've got to take a short break. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Nigeria's best loved comedian and one of Africa's top actors, in Kem Owo. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagulu. Today, we we'll look back at the career of one of Nigeria's best loved actors, comedians, satirists, and screenwriters, Nkem Owo. He's ranked as one of Nigeria's funniest performers ever, a brilliant thespian whose sense of comedic timing has made his numerous appearances in Hollywood films a joy to behold, Nollywood rather. Some of his most popular performances include titles like Big Man, Big Trouble and The Master, a film about email fraud. He also starred in the Nollywood sales record breaker Osofia in London, a fish out of water comedy about a man from rural Nigeria trying to get by in London. And then there's Lionheart, in which he co starred alongside Genevieve Naji. I will leave for posterity is you, my daughter. I think you're going to be a very good MD, Ma. My father is still very much alive, aren't you? You must be a proud father. Of course, I'm immensely proud of my daughter. She's uh, her father's daughter. Hey! Chief! Daddy? Chief! Uh, Daddy, what's wrong? My uh, deepest condolences. Uh, sorry, my uh, best wishes will you know be... Uh, well, I don't know why you're... The Lionheart will have to soldier on until I get back on my feet. I now name my replacement. Chief God's will. The bottom the one. His reasons have nothing to do with you being a woman. Your uncle is just here to supervise. 
I'm going to change a lot of things in this establishment. So, given our current situation, can you tell us how bad the numbers are? Bad. Lionheart is in severe debt. 950 million naira. What? And now it's time to pay up. In 30 days. Or risk losing everything. If we have to fight this war, we have to fight it together, unless we want to lose. It is no more a secret that I have an interest in Lionheart. And if this Igwe Pascal of a man gets a hold of our company, everyone will lose their jobs. And they're all depending on me, and I feel like I'm feeling. No, 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 no! no. Stop it! You're a businesswoman. You've always been able to do anything you put your mind to. And of course, uh, Kem O oh were prominent in that film. The, he's the comedy great, and he is still with me from our studios in Lagos. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And just looking at that trailer um, for Lionheart, two years ago, you starred in that movie that claimed, came close to achieving the ultimate movie accolade globally. The Lionheart. Um, with Genevieve Naji was disqualified from the international best feature film category at the Oscars because it was largely in English um, and only had about 11 minutes or so in the Igbo language. It was Nigeria's first submission to the Oscars and clearly a chance missed. What really happened there? Well, I'll say that uh, let me start first by commending my fellow Nigerian fellow artists who are in this industry, who are pushing this industry forward. Uh, when uh, Ed Genevieve approached me for this, I was thrilled, you know, but my initial thought was uh, we're going to do a Nigerian thing. But when we started having the press out discussing more, I was meant to understand that it is a very special case and it's something she intended to use for international competition or whatever, for awards and all that. So, well, it didn't come to me as a surprise because I know that uh, we have been trying. I know that one day we're going to move to that circle where the world will recognize us and I'm happy it is happening in my before. So, uh, after all the talks, I had to put in my best of the best because I had already been told that uh, this is not just uh, for local markets and all that they needed. And that is what that was what I needed then, this uh, international recognition. So I had to put in everything. And I have to praise uh, Genevieve Naji and the crew for doing a very fantastic job of that very film. And uh, going places to premiere it, we were in Canada, for the premier were in Marrakesh in Morocco for the premier. Uh, she really moved around with the, with, with the film. So I'm not surprised that it's been recognized by whichever organization in the Western world that uh, wants to, to look into it. I, I think it's worth it. And I'm happy about it. And I'm happy Nigerian filmmakers are moving forward. And uh, you mentioned there, Nkem, that, that you were, one of the reasons you made that movie was that you were seeking international recognition. Has that recognition now come? Right. Uh, are you getting more international in the work that you do? Well, I wasn't looking for international recognition as per my going there to be in Hollywood and acting and being. I was looking for that kind of a recognition that will enhance the cultural values of my people, which was my intention of even going into this uh, entertainment to project my people, to project the culture of my people. And uh, what I really wanted then was to um, get their technology to push our own story, because we have a lot of stories that had not been told. We we'll have a, th a lot of things in our culture that we would like to push out that has not been pushed out. So I wasn't looking for recognition for myself as per se. I was looking for recognition of our culture and where we started. I mean, and I was I was I was impressed that 
some of the countries that started before us, somewhere along the line, it looks we were like we were overtaking them. So that was that kind of recognition I wanted, and that was what uh, we were shifting uh, towards, and I'm happy about it. And of course, the advantage of Nigeria is that it, Nigeria is such a huge market. I mean, it's got over 200 million people, and, and you could well become an enormous celebrity, which you are, in your own right within Nigeria alone. But of course, in your case, um, your accolade is, is all across the continent and beyond. And you also starred in the, 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 that uh, short clip we saw at the outset, uh, the Nollywood sales record breaker Osofia in London, which is a sort of fish out of water comedy about a rural Nigerian trying to get by in London. And that was an absolutely hilarious movie. Tell us how the film came about. Well, when, <clears throat> when uh, during the <clears throat> gestation period of Osofia in London, a lot of ideas were coming and we were afraid of a lot of things that probably if we do this and we want to involve London, UK and all that and uh, there are certain things we will do and they will reject it. And uh, after a lot of consultation going for feasibility studies in London and a lot of other places we come to the fact that I mean we just have to do this in our own way. Let them recognize it the way we present it. And we presented it that way, <clears throat> excuse me. So most of the things that happened is in Osofia in London, uh, some of the things were not even really in the script. What we did was just take our chance. The producer, Kinsley Ogoro, who I ad admire so much, his doggedness, if he wants something, he will get it. And uh, we went there and we started getting some um, ad libs, you know, adding some addendums to the thing because of what we saw on ground. We were adapting to it. So some of the things that happened in South in London were not just what we prepared here. What we met there influenced some of the things we did there. And, uh, you know, people would think that they were all written the script. No, at times the director could come and say, look, this thing is happening, so why don't we do... And that was why the thing became so popular, because we were not trying to act like the people were, I mean, the Londoners, you know, or Hollywood. We were trying to present our own thing in our own way in their place. And I think that that is one of the I things thought. that you're, you're well noted for, um, Kem, your, your incredible ability at improvisation. Please stay with us. We're going to talk a bit more about that. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Nigeria's best-loved comedian and one of Africa's top actors, Kem Owo. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolu. My guest today is the great comedian Nkem Owo, who is a Nigerian actor, comedian, singer, satirist, screenwriter, and producer, and an iconic character in Nigerian culture. Without a doubt, he qualifies to appear on a list of the five funniest Nigerian comedians of all time. His comedy routines are often hilariously offbeat and cheeky and regularly attract huge audiences in cinemas across Africa. He's well known for his incredible improvisation skills, both in films and on stage, and for his uncompromising examinations of social issues in society, in the funniest way possible, of course, portraying happy-go-lucky characters, characters who, though not always successful, often use confidence and optimism to persuade people to believe in him. <laughs> 
I have to say, this is a real cracker. And the comedian, actor, satirist, screenwriter, and producer in Kem Owa is still with me from our Lagos studio. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, I don't know how you do it, mate, but you do it brilliantly well. And at one stage, um, you. you became quite famous um, for singing a song about email scams <coughs> called Oyibo, I Go Chop Your Dollar, which is pigeon for white man, I'm going to take your money. It's from the movie The Master, and the song was banned from being played on the radio. How do you reflect on that today, more than a decade later? Well, I must say that that was one of the projects that brought me a lot of troubles and a lot of uh, publicity. <laughs> when I sang at it, I Go Chop Your Dollar, it uh, created uproar uh, amongst our people who are living outside the country who didn't like the fact that uh, bad image is being created <coughs> by uh, uh, people of this country. But I tried to tell them that that wasn't the case. Even when I was interviewed by some of these uh, uh, foreign journalists about I Go Chop Your Dollar, I told them, I Go Chop Your Dollar is a theme that deals or dealt with uh, fraud and fraudsters. At the end of the whole thing, we sat down and we say, you don't have to practice this because it is against the law. But we have to use it to project or to bring out these ills of the society. That was why we had to do it the way we did it. And after we did it, the theme music became very popular. You know, and then the producer came around and said, look, why don't we move this... Uh, the, the theme music and make it a separate uh, project of its own. I said, well, I buy that. And he ran around for it, and uh, after that, the thing came uh, out. But the thing is that people misunderstood the whole thing, and I said, you know, I remember the kind of uh, this thing I, w I went through in the Netherlands, where when I came to do a show, and they said uh, the head of the 419 is in town, so everybody <laughs> come around. And they came with a lot of policemen, a lot of, uh, you know, even helicopter, police vans, what, name it. And at the end of the whole thing, some 180 Nigerians were sent home. It didn't make me happy. But for the fact that I didn't understand it, I, I would have enjoyed it if the thing had been positive all through. But because of this misunderstanding, it didn't... Uh, it didn't make me that happy. But the fact that I went to do a show and people said, oh, I sang, I go chop your dollar and uh, because of it. And I think it was, uh, somebody was uh, referring to uh, this lady in, in, in the U.S. that uh, used it in her program and said, look, one of the big actors in Nigeria is trying to uh, give support to f uh, fraud and all that. But that wasn't the case. We just decided to harness what we had we have this fame, it made, it's, uh, it made uh, a headway. Uh, I mean, people bought into it, and then we thought that the music is going to enhance uh, the film economically. Because when you're selling the film and you're selling the records, I think uh, uh, it's good for both the actors and actresses and the producers and all the crew. So that was what we did, and the music came up. After that, I had a lot of criticism. As a matter of fact, some people came and said there was a security service. Uh, how did I do this? And I just made them laugh in my office. I said, look, I gave them one or two analogies. And they understood me, and they went away without uh, further disturbing me or disturbing my work. So that music, I am happy because of the publicity, but because of the things I got, the feedback I was getting that was not impressive, I said, well, it's all right, some people love it, some people don't love it. Like anything in life, some people must love and some people must hate it. So I just took it like that. And I think within my mind is a hit. 
Well, I mean, beyond your mind, uh, in reality, it was a hit. Not only the song, but the movie, The Master, was an enormous hit, which was just incredibly popular, um, not just in Nigeria, but across the continent. But, but in terms of the dark side of things, I mean, you mentioned that um, issue, your arrest in Amsterdam, I think it was 2007, um, there were all kinds That's of right. suspicions, but obviously you, you were released and there was no problem there. But two years later, in 2009, you were kidnapped in southeast Nigeria and, and your abduction or your abductors demanded a 15 million naira ransom and you were released um, subsequently after your family paid a ransom. Um, tell us about that experience. Well, <clears throat> it's an experience I wouldn't like to experience again. <laughs> I would like to let it go. But that was a very bitter experience. Honestly, I wasn't thinking that somebody who made people happy and not could be kidnapped that way. But it was in the course of business anyway. I was invited to go to Prakot to perform for some church. And uh, on my way there, you know, how these people, the bad, well, bandits, whatever you call them, they kidnapped me and they put me in the boot of my car and they took me somewhere I didn't know uh, in the night. I was just moving around. But one thing I found out when I was in that captivity was that uh, it wasn't because of me. It was because of the situation in the country. A lot of things, a lot of young men who young men who didn't have work to do, were putting hearts into this. As a matter of fact, when they kidnapped me, it's like they showed surprise. I don't know whether it was real or uh, it was fake. They showed surprise. Oh, was it you? I said, yes, it was me. I said, come and sit down here. I sat down here. My luck was that most of the people who kidnapped, or rather the people who kidnapped me were my fans. So we were just discussing, provided I don't look at them, or I didn't look at them then. That was the instruction they gave to me. And I wasn't looking at them. And uh, we were discussing. It was a very bitter experience. My, my legs were chained so that I don't escape in the night. And they kept telling me, look, please, we're not doing this because it is you. You know, because of certain things, they gave me a lot of stories of politicians they have worked with that didn't pay them, and all that, and all that, and all that. So they were just using me to see if they could make some money. And uh, even though it was a very bad something, I tried within that thing to talk to some people in the corridors of power to see whether, in my own little way, some influence could be brought to bear on the youth of this society, how to improve on their living standard and uh, how we can cope some of these things. It was a, a bitter experience, but they think, well, it's an experience all the same. And I don't think I'm going to go for a second tenure. <laughs> well, uh, we, we don't want you to go for a second, <laughs> for a second crack at it. But in terms of the really dark things that have happened to you, Nkem, your elder brother, Bartholomew, was one of three young Nigerians executed by General Buhari in the 1980s after Mr. Buhari took over in a military <coughs> coup in Nigeria. I can't even begin to imagine what a traumatic experience that must have been for you. Buhari is, of course, Nigeria's current president. Your brother, along with two others, were executed by firing squad for a crime which was not punishable by death. Um, they had dealt in drugs, apparently. What influence has that experience had on your life? Well, if I could understand your, your question very well. It was about my brother that was killed uh, during the, the military era, Batlomi Owo. He was a brother and a friend because we were close. Yes, as a human being, when somebody who's close to you was killed in that kind of circumstance. In fact, I was working with the, uh, the Anambra television that time, and I was so furious that I was shedding tears along the corridors 
because I didn't see. The only thing that touched me, in fact, the thing that touched me most was the fact that they had to shift the date of um, effective date of that decree. You know, during the military era, we can want to, if they want to stop something, they can just get out one decree, and then uh, the next minute the thing is in operation. So for them to backdate it, to involve or include people who did not commit the offense within their own regime, years back, I was very, very bitter, and I thought it was a personal thing to me. Why would it be shifted back to include people who didn't commit the offense before the decree was, uh, was uh, uh, promulgated or whatever it is? So that was, I was very bitter about it, honestly. And I said a lot of things, even outside. It was a traumatic experience for me, just like you said, and uh, to people, my own people and people around me. But we have taken it as a movement, development, evolution of a country or a society or a culture. I just took it like that. I started to forget it. Then. I never really thought about it or talked anything about it. We just have to go and uh, sit inside and think about it in your room with your own people. And that's all. I didn't want to make it an issue because I have uh, come to a place where or a position where I could make some noise and people will hear me. Well, I mean, we're, I we're certainly not going to make it happened. an issue here. And, and we appreciate very much indeed your sharing something so personal with us. And please stay with us. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with a comedian, actor, satirist, screenwriter and producer in Kem Owo. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Zanyagolu. Now, my guest today, Nkem Owo, has achieved huge success through his comedy, his acting roles on screen, and he continues to break box office records. Known by many as Osofia, he has an almost endless supply of characters and situations that he draws on for material. Since the 1990s, when he first came to national and international attention, his rise to the top has been steady and consistent, and his movies sell out huge audiences eager to see his classic comic performances. He's won numerous awards, including Best Actor at the the African Movie Awards, accolades that have helped to propel him into the African stratosphere as a Nigerian megastar. Today, he's celebrated as one of Nigeria's funniest, high-profile and most enduring comedians. And the masterfully accomplished thespian, Kem Owa, is still with me from our Lagos studios. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us and for giving us the amount of time that you have. Um, and of course, in the course of your career, you've starred alongside people, actors who've helped you make your movies um, even more interesting and funny. I mean, people like Sam Loco, for example, Patience Ozokwo, etc. Uh, how important are people like that to your career? Because, I mean, you obviously bounce things off them when you're making a movie. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let me start with some local AFL blessed memory. Uh, he was not just a colleague, he was a friend of mine. And I, what I found so interesting about him was that uh, he does these impromptu comedy things. You know, at times without, a, you know, dialogue and just like me or just like people say, I do. So we found out that we rapport, the rapport between myself and the late Sam Loco Efe was uh, very unique. So we could even make a story up ourselves and then begin to act it and we think it's written. It wasn't, it wasn't written. But all those people were brought together because we had an aim of projecting ourselves in a certain level. Ozoko came in uh, uh, Sam Loko, Ozoko, I was having my, at the back of my mind, the, the, the focus of projecting our culture and projecting, and I was trying to see if I could ally, I could ally with people 
who have it, who I can influence what I am trying to do in a positive way. And they did. And I worked so perfectly with them. Even as I up to now, those were my closest friends. You know, they're my closest colleagues and they're my closest friends. Up to now, apart from some local who had gone away somewhere, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that even the present crop of people, this is the kind of relationship that should be expected in this kind of industry. And that is what moves the industry forward. We didn't see it. When we started this industry, as a matter of fact, we didn't know it was going to come this far at this short time or within this period of time. But if you look at China, you look at India, you look at those people who started doing it years before us, you will now begin to project your own 50 years and all that. But within 20 years, we have achieved what they have achieved in 100 years. So bringing people like that together helped me to achieve what I had at the back of my mind. And uh, I, I believe Nigerians got the better of it. And I'm impressed and I'm happy about that. And um, were there any particular entertainers, both Nigerian and non-Nigerian, who inspired you when you were trying to get, in, to get into comedy, when you were sort of in the early stages of it? Well, a lot of people inspired me when I was coming. People like um, Sadiq Daba. He didn't know, but he was one of the idols I was looking up to then. Pete Iduchie was another person. In fact, the films they starred in are called Cram their, their Lines and all that. I looked up to them and uh, I used what I got from them, their influence as a stepping stone to move to where I am now. Yes, there are some Richard Pryor, some of those uh, big uh, foreign comedians, they really influenced me. But what I did was uh, bring out the comedy in the Hollywood and then situate it with the comedy in Nigeria from some of those people I have mentioned. And uh, the mix becomes uh, wonderful. And I think it is the mix that I decided to follow. I get the thing from Sadiq Daba, from Peter Dochier, from Baba Salah, some of these uh, people are there, from Richard Pryor, uh, a lot of them there, because I used to watch their films a lot from Hollywood comedy. So I list the two together, and I found an effective concrete, and I followed that concrete. Well, that's, that's a very good piece of advice for someone who is interested in getting into the business. Um, take all the things that you can and make them your own. In your case, you Nigerianized them and made them um, very, very uniquely something coming out of Nkem Owo. So, so what are you working on right now in terms of movies or m music or stand-up, etc.? What's your, or where's your career headed these days? <clears throat> well, my career, uh, as I see it, I am now going towards my retirement. So if I hadn't made a career that has a direction up to this point, then I'm a failure. Uh, my, but my main objective is to bring other people. That's why most of the time you don't see me in films now. I used to have a film school in Lagos, which I'm trying to reestablish in Enugu so that I can encourage. That will be my contribution to humanity from the talent given to me by God. So I am trying to see a way of uh, putting, that's something, that's a project I have online, which I think will be uh, a revolution of our comedy. But I don't want to let the, uh, the cat out of the bag, as they say. So, but uh, uh, generally, I think uh, my career has been a very good one, and uh, it has influenced a lot of people Positively, but I am just one man. A lot of people come to me and say, "Look, I want to be like you." I say, "No, you don't want to have to be like me. You have to be better than I am." 
some will imbibe it, some are in a hurry, they put their head. And I advise everybody who is coming into this industry, particularly comedy, to tarry, to have that patience, perseverance to move ahead. If you think you can come and just fling money and then go, it doesn't work that way. If you have the talent, come to be projected. No matter your field of uh, specialization. After all, I read engineering school, and I'm now an engineer by certificate and a show businessman by profession. So this is what the thing is. So you have to put everything to it, and if it's working for you, pursue it and encourage the others. That's a, that's a very good piece of advice there. We're in the dying minute of, of the interview. What would you say have been the highs and lows of fame as an actor and a comedian for you? Sorry, I didn't get that question right. Ted, uh, what would you say, what would Come you again. say have been the highs and the lows of fame as an actor and a comedian for you? And we've got about a minute left. Oh, a lot of things, you know. Uh, the thing is, uh, if God helps you and you become a star, be ready to absorb a lot of things, a lot of a lot of stones, and then a lot of appreciation. If you're that kind of a person who thinks, because everybody likes me and everybody likes me, it has an upside and a downside. So you have to be prepared for it. Being a star is one thing, managing your stardom is another. So I think I, the high and the low, I don't want to begin to uh, split it or begin to analyze it as by the economical, the social effect, the economic effect and all that and all that. But what I know is anybody who wants to pursue right. it the way I did will have to recognize that fact that there are highs and there are lows here. It will come. Okay. Kem Owo, you are a masterfully accomplished thespian and we appreciate the time that you've given us today. And Kem Owo was talking to me there from our studios in Lagos. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and Lagos. Bye bye and thank you for watching.